my name is Marie Hill Faison, and I am your facilitator uh, for this meeting. Good to see everybody. I'm not real fancy on the Zoom thing, so I don't know how many people are, are on, but um, glad to see the people that, that I do see and welcome to the people that I don't see. <laughs> so, um, uh, as I said, I'm a rehill facing and I, um, I drive for Go Durham Paratransit. And so I'm very interested in the topic today and glad that I was asked to facilitate because I'm always interested in hearing what's, uh, what the future brings. But I'm uh, going to move right along because we don't have a whole lot of time. And um, I just want to say that uh, this coalition meets every third Monday. And, uh, and so that if people are interested in when we meet uh, for affordable housing and transit, I uh, guess I will introduce the spotlight person. Uh, am I supposed to introduce them or are you, Eric? Uh, I think you can, although I know him well. Okay. And, yeah, and I don't need any formality, Marie, so whatever you want to do. Well, Dan, <laughs> I, I'm just going to be, you know, since they asked me to do it, <laughs> I'll just go ahead and say that you're going to speak about the Willett, Willett uh, Apartments, which I'm interested in hearing about and uh, see what the availability is, if we could still tell people to come and, and apply for those apartments and things of that nature. So we give the floor to Dan Levine from Self Help. Great, thanks so much for the introduction. I'm gonna share my screen with gratitude to Becky for putting together a um, little PowerPoint just to show some pictures. Um, so let me know, hopefully that's showing up now. Um, so I, I'll try to be brief and then I'm more than happy offline or, or whenever you like to talk more with your group. I, I think most importantly, for those of you who've been involved in the coalition for a while, you know that you were key uh, as an organization, along with Durham Can and others, in advocating that the city actually make this land next to the transit station available um, for affordable housing. So that's really, if I say nothing else, I want to make sure people hear that because that was a powerful um, part of this project. So we, uh, with DHIC, um, longstanding nonprofit out of Raleigh, um, that self-help had worked with before we applied to be considered by the city. We're selected several years ago to build affordable housing at the transit station. And less than a month ago, the very end of March, we finished. And so, um, let's see. So this is the view if you, this is a maybe a week or two old, but if you're to go out there now, um, standing at the corner of Willard and Jackson Street, you can see um, the apartments, I'll point out, not only are there 82 affordable apartments, all affordable below 60% of AMI, I'm going to quarter those for below 30% of AMI, but there's also um, under construction right now, the upfit on a 5,000 square foot, um, what will be a nonprofit dental clinic called Local Start, which is going to be serving um, low wealth folks across the community, providing kind of advanced dental care uh, implants and other things, that even if you're one of the few who has good dental insurance are hard things to get, and let alone for people who are uninsured or underinsured. Um, so that's going to be opening in the summer. And then we've got um, 82 apartments, um, a little less than half of those as, uh, as or sorry, about half and a half, one bedroom and two bedrooms. About 23 of those units as of the end of last week were already filled up in terms of people having moved in. We do, to your question, um, Marie, that we do have applications. We cut off applications um, actually months ago because there's so much demand. So we reached our target of 200 applicants to fill um, the 50 plus spaces that are kind of available to the general public. There are also 21 of the units that will be referred by the housing authority, people who have vouchers or live in existing housing authority Departments, and then there's several units that are referred by the State Department of Health and Human Services, which is um, people with disabilities and barriers to housing who'll be referred directly to the project. So all told, 82 units. Um, we did some special touches, as you can see here, like um, this is a, a local artist named Darius Quarles. We commissioned him and others to do some paintings for the inside. 
There's also, um, if you go by the site now, you will see another local artist, um, Gabe Engloats, who's going to be painting these huge 20-plus um, foot tall panels with a mural um, that's going to be really visible, particularly from the bus station. So trying to put some nice touches in, in addition to the kind of the core, which is giving people a beautiful place to live at affordable rents um, and, you know, the most transit friendly, walkable location in Durham. Um, and then like all of these low income housing tax credit developments, there's great community amenities. So community room, computer room, we actually have um, Wi-Fi that's available, it's kind of included in folks' rent to give them access, which when we started doing this project felt like a, a nice little extra and now feels like an absolute necessity given the year we've had um, together as a community. Um, and so beyond that, I'm going to stop right there because I think I had five minutes and I don't want to eat up on the agenda, but happy to, to take any questions um, from folks now or offline if, if you want to um, connect more deeply. Now, people can post questions in the chat, and we also will have a period of question and discussion towards the end. So um, we'll hold off on that right now. Uh, next, we have uh, Eric, uh, and he'll be uh, discussing the transit equity campaign. He's team leader, and uh, we'll listen to him now, Eric. Thanks, Murray. Um, good to see you again. <laughs> We've been uh, doing a few of these recently, so this is good to get, get the word out about the campaign and everything that's going on with the transit plan update. Um, so as Marie said, my name is Eric Lanfried. I um, am the campaign manager for the transit equity campaign. Uh, I'm doing that on behalf of Bike Durham, but there are four other partner organizations uh, that are part of the campaign, and one of which is this coalition. Um, so we thank the coalition very much for, for participating in it. Uh, in particular, uh, Becky Wenders and Jim Sparra have been um, have been great to, to work with. They've uh, been been with us kind of since the beginning, since we got started um, this summer and, and fall and, and moving into the spring. Um, so I won't go through all the details. We've talked about the, the transit equity campaign before, but for anyone who is new to this, uh, very briefly, the idea of the campaign is that there is uh, an update to the Durham Transit Plan, which is happening right now, and you will hear about that uh, momentarily from uh, Project Lead uh, and um, also from uh, another member of the, the Durham Transit team, as they've been uh, referring themselves as. Uh, but with this update, there's, a, there's an enormous uh, opportunity to really um, reshape transit in, in Durham and the larger region. Uh, there are actually two other transit plan updates happening simultaneously. Wake County and Orange County are also updating their plans. So again, big opportunity to, to think about how transit um, should be moving forward. Unfortunately, with the demise of the light rail project a couple of years ago, um, that means that there are additional resources now available and we need to prioritize them in Durham. So the goal of the campaign is um, we are pushing for the transit team and the elected officials, the, the board members who are going to be ultimately approving the update to this plan uh, to prioritize the needs of current transit riders, uh, transit workers such as Marie uh, and uh, low wealth communities of color in Durham. Um, we're asking that be the first priority in, in the plan update. Uh, these are the people who, who use transit every day in a lot of cases or provide a transit service. Um, and there are, you know, still deficiencies in the system and we've, we've been hearing about them over the past several months uh, and several years um, that still need to be addressed. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's sort of the goal of, of the campaign. One of the big strategies we have for this campaign is uh, to make sure that the voices of those communities, uh, the, the people we mentioned, the, the transit providers, the workers, uh, the low wealth communities of color, um, you know, that those, those voices be put uh, front and center, right? We don't want to uh, just hear from uh, from people like me. Uh, we we're, our goal is to uplift those voices, and so that. Um, to that end, we commissioned uh, two local videographers 
uh, John Law and Salim Breshamwala, who are uh, excellent to work with, uh, to produce four different videos on behalf of the Transit Equity Campaign. And we're gonna show those to you now. Uh, they're quite short, so don't, you hear four videos, you think, oh, well, I'm gonna be sitting here for an hour. They are six minutes total, so um, they go by pretty quickly. Um, but we, we think they're pretty, pretty powerful uh, in telling the stories of, of transit riders and workers. Um, so with that, I'm going to attempt to share my screen and play these. Hopefully they will come out pretty well. Um, I'm just going to start playing them. If, if you cannot, if someone cannot hear them or there's something else going wrong uh, with the videos, just let me know and I'll, I'll pause and see if I can do something to fix that. But you never know with technology, so I'll do my best. Um, and then after the videos, we'll have um, uh, maybe take a couple quick questions or comments, and then I, I will turn it over to the to Aaron and Ellen and other members of the transit team to talk about where they are with the plan update itself, because uh, that's really what this campaign is focused on. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and hope that this happens, works well. Best thing about here is a lot of people do like depend on us. I just like being a part of that. You know, people trying to get from point A to point B, and it's my job to get them in that state, but that's what I do. I would like people to know that this service is extremely important for our community. I can listen to my audio books while I'm on the bus. Uh, sometimes I do talk to people on the bus, get to know people, passengers that ride every day like I do. Lock the door. People use transportation just like they use their own car. And if their car wasn't reliable, let's say their car could only crank up every hour, they would be so frustrated. So they have to look at it like that. Like this is our car and we need it to be more reliable. I say there's more bus stops. I actually had to transfer my oldest daughter to school because there's no city bus that goes there, but it's in Durham. So, and from the city bus taking to her school is about a 20, 25 minute walk from the nearest bus stop. So that was too much for me. Um, and I transferred her school, which is an easier city bus route in case I had to get there. You can't run more than three errands on a day using this bus system if you're gonna do business. Now, if you're in your car, goodness, you could run lots of errands during the day, but it's, it's not so easy for those of us who use the bus. Sometimes there's a certain, something that looks like a utility pole, sometimes there's just a sign. It's harder to find, see, for me, that pole is much harder to find than a, a huge bus shelter. So there's no sidewalk at all. Um, the bus stop, if I do decide to catch the 9A, the bus stop is literally in the street on this side. And on the other side, it's like in the street and then there's like a drop heel. So if you had like a stroller or if I want to take my daughter, it would be impossible. Durham is a growing city, so eventually the routes are going to have to cover that or they're going to have to come up with new routes. So I, I wish that there was more bus routes and I wish that they ran more often, like more frequently. I wish that the actual bus stops in this city would be more consistently located. The bus takes a long time to get here, but I'd rather have the bus take a long time to get here to walk. Before I show the last three, I just want to check to make sure, are folks able to see and hear that generally? Someone could just give me a verbal. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, yes we, can, we can hear it just fine. Definitely. Great, see it just fine. Thank you so much. Just want to make sure. All right, so these last three are, are much shorter. They're little sort of vignettes, uh, little stories, uh, individual stories. Um, 
about uh, specific transit riders in most cases, or in one case you'll see is about Marine. So listen up. I met some unbelievable people and shared their lives. It means a lot to me to be connected into the community and to make sure that I can try and improve anywhere. I use paratransit to get to places that I don't go very often and therefore I don't know what the bus route is like. You see some of the same people and it's more of a connection because people are going through uh, physical challenges in their lives. I would like people to know that this service is extremely important for our community because people are unaware that they might end up riding this service. For some people who use walkers or wheelchairs, I would think that some of those bus stops would be difficult to access. Lighting, if it's dark, the bus can pass you if they don't see you. That's happened a lot of times. It would help to put some new sidewalks in the village because those ones are kind of old. We definitely need sidewalks. More sidewalks to the buses. More sidewalks, more bus shelters. Because I depend on the bus so much, a lot of times I'm a walker too. I go down certain streets and there's not even sidewalks. You got to walk in the street. I set up as uh, to go with my friend to take her first uh, Corona-19 vaccination. So I chose to you know, to take public transportation today in order to take her to her appointment. You know, I've been using the bus in Durham from the old station they used to have years ago. They used to have one bus on this route. The old bus used to break down. And I know a lot of people I know that lived out here lost a lot of jobs because of that. But now it's been improved in the last three years where the newer buses that they purchased. All right, so those are the videos. Um, I want to thank all the participants in the videos. Oh, hold on, I gotta, now we've got another video playing. Oh, it's an NBA video, hold on, I'll come back. All right, there we go. Uh, you can tell I'm also an NBA fan because that's what plays right after the transit equity campaign videos. Um, but no, I want to thank again the, the, the um, everyone who participated in these uh, videos for their their time uh, and effort. It was really, really valuable, um, especially people like Marie, uh, who took time out of a, a busy schedule to, uh, to, to help uh, with these videos. Um, also to the videographers, again, John and Salim, who just did a fabulous job with these. Um, I'm gonna put a link to a blog post that we, um, that we put up on the Bike Durham site that contains all these videos and has a few more notes about them. Um, so if you are able to share these widely through your networks or um, if you're on social media, we would really appreciate it um, just to continue to get the, these voices out into the public. Um, and with that, uh, we have about five minutes. If there are any um, questions or comments specifically on videos or anything else about the transit campaign, go ahead and pose them now. And um, we do have, again, we've got people like Marie here who can help answer questions as well. Uh, and then we will move on to, to Aaron and Ellen. I have a question. Go ahead. Do you all, do you all know how long it will be before um, some of the things that the people on the video were saying that they needed like, like sidewalks, more bus shelters, um, and it was something else. I don't forget, but do you know how long that will take place? 
and when it would begin? Um, I can, I'll take a stab at that, but then if, if either Aaron or um, Ellen wanna chime in as well from the Durham Transit team, um, again, a big part of it is it'll depend on what is prioritized in this plan update, right? So um, I'll be extreme here. I don't think this is what's going to happen, of course, but uh, if, if, you know, in the first year of the next year of that transit plan, um, there is all the money is set aside for bus shelters. Again, that's not what's going to happen, but just as a hypothetical, then certainly you could see those being put up um, fairly quickly. Now, there are anytime there's anything like sidewalks or, or bus shelters, any sort of infrastructure, uh, it does take a little bit of time to uh, develop those things, to purchase materials, to get con uh, construction crews, to grading, lighting, all the different things that have to go into a project like that. Um, and same thing for service, right? It, it, with new bus service, um, it will depend on whether new buses need to be purchased first. Um, so if it's at times of days when there are buses, uh, sort of excess buses available, such as at night or on Sundays, that service could potentially be um, offered up fairly quickly once they're able to hire new bus operators. But if it's a new sort of peak service, so it's a new time when all, nearly all the buses are out there on the road, there is a little bit of lead time to purchase the buses first and hire the operators. That could be you know, 12 to 18 months in some cases. Um, Aaron or, or Ellen, do you want anything add, add anything to that? Sure. Um, I can first talk about the shelters. Those are already, uh, those improvements are already taking place. So we've been funding improvements in bus shelters for a couple of years now. Uh, started off modestly with like 10, moved up to 25. Uh, the goal this year is to get at least 50 installed and to design a number uh, uh, at least 75 this year. And then so next year we'd be installing another 75 and just trying to ramp that up as much as we can. It, you know, there's only, it's only access to so many shelters. It takes, you know, a certain amount of personnel to design the plans, get the plans approved and all that sort of thing. But, but the goal is to get do at least 75 next year and then ramp up that, that as much as, as we have the uh, personnel to do it and, and the funding to do it as well. But, and all, uh, and we'll talk about this later, all of these scenarios um, envision all of our bus stops being improved in some way, shape or form uh, by the end of the plan in the next few years. Uh, regarding sidewalks, there's already uh, designs for improvements on sidewalks. I have one other question. Sure. Um, do you all work with the DLT as far as um, some of the people on the video was stating that, you know, a lot of the bus stops are not in places where sidewalks are. So is mm -hmm. DOT working with you all as far as that? Uh, DOT, do you mean, if you mean city DOT, then yes. Uh, we're working with them to uh, provide funding because this is a transit plan. We are focused on sidewalks that will help people uh, get access to transit stops. And so like, for example, and, and Ellen maybe can speak to a little more specificity on this. She has a little more uh, background with it, but I know that we've got designs in place for uh, some improved sidewalks on Chapel Hill Road, kind of in that, that Lakewood area, as well as uh, I think designs are going on now for Holloway Street and Fayetteville Street. Now it may take a year, it probably will take a year or two for those to actually get on the ground once the uh, designs are done and get approved and you know contractors hired and so forth. But in the next couple of years, we should see uh, bus stop improvements and sidewalks in all three of those corridors. And then the transit plans also envision some additional corridors for sidewalks. And in addition to that, we have other sidewalk projects that the city is moving forward on that are different from, have different funding or different from the transit plan on say Marine Road, um, and now the others are skipped. Marine one's the, the big one. Uh, there's a couple of others I know going on uh, whose names are escaping me right now. Ellen, do you wanna chime in here? Yeah, sure. Um, hi everyone, uh, Ellen Beckman, uh, Durham County Transportation Manager. Um, some of y'all know me because I used to work at the city for about 15 years and I worked a lot on the building sidewalks. 
Um, so like Aaron said, there's a lot of sidewalk projects in development by the city. Like almost all sidewalk projects are really built by the city. Um, a few are built by NCDOT, but most of them are built by the city. So the, the city's website, Transportation Department, has a lot of information about the sidewalk projects that are in design. Um, like Aaron's saying, um, a portion of those sidewalks are funded by the transit plan, but a lot of them are funded through other city or federal funding sources. Um, I, I saw a comment that said, what about Bragtown? Um, I, you know, offhand, I know the city has a project on Roxboro through Bragtown that I think is um, out for construction, which is great. It's one of the most recently bid projects. Um, and I know they have a project on Old Oxford as well that's in designed by Public Works. Um, so there, I mean, there's a lot of sidewalks. Um, it's really probably more than we can talk about today, uh, but the city's website is a good source of information on that. Thanks. I, I wanna make sure that we, we do move along. That was a, a great question and thanks for the responses. Um, and you can continue to put questions in the chat um, and, and the speakers can get to them hopefully at the uh, end. But I do wanna give Aaron an opportunity to give a, a short presentation. And, and again, I'll make sure to leave about 10 minutes at the end of that for any other uh, comments and questions that come up. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess that's that's to us. And actually, Ellen's going to start off this presentation. I'm going to uh, oh, okay. Thank you. back clean up here. All right. Let me um, share my screen. Let me make sure this is going to work. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And mm -hmm. I'm going to switch to the slide view. Hopefully that also works. Okay. Do you see the whole? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so thanks for having us here today. Um, as I said, I'm, I work for Durham County as transportation manager and Aaron works for the DCHC MPO. Um, we are um, co-directing the Durham Transit Plan update right now. Um, and we have a hopefully brief presentation that provides you some background on it. Uh, the results from the first round of outreach, uh, what we're planning on for the second round uh, which includes our scenario developments um, and our next steps. So um, as Eric mentioned, the Durham Transit Plan is the plan that guides the use of the countywide taxes and fees for public transportation. Uh, the, it's approximately $35 million a year is generated through those taxes and fees. Um, the primary source of funding is the sales tax the half cent sales tax, which was approved in 2011. Uh, our transit plan is gonna be a 20 year plan, um, but it, it can be amended. It's not only every 20 years. Um, we have a continuous process that is updating the plan. And uh, every four to five years, we look at it in coordination with the MPO's long range plan. Uh, as state law, says uh, this, has to, this plan has to be adopted by three boards, the Durham County Board of Commissioners, the Go Triangle Board of Trustees, and the Durham Chapel Hill Carborough Metropolitan Planning Organization Board. Um, those last two boards are you know, regional organizations. They both do have represent, representation from the city council and the county commissioners. And uh, you know, we first adopted a a transit plan in 2011 that, that initiated the sales tax referendum. And then we um, updated it again in 2017 due to funding needs for the Durham Orange Light Rail project. And as everyone knows, the Durham Orange Light Rail project was discontinued in 2019. So that is what is initiating this update to the plan. Uh, this really is our first big picture wholesale uh, revamp of the plan since 2011. You know, we're looking at re local needs, uh, regional needs, you know, looking at how we can um, replace some of the transit needs that were being provided by the light rail project, as well as looking to Wake County, uh, which has since, you know, adopted a transit plan um, as well. So um, this is where we are in the process. We're about halfway. You know, we did some initial outreach with the Durham comp plan listening and learning sessions, uh, but really our first 
round of engagement, uh, which was done in the fall, was focused on our goals and objectives and uh, the existing conditions of the transit system. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the results from that first round in this presentation. Uh, our second round of engagement will be focused on the scenarios. Um, and we are really deep in the weeds of developing those scenarios. We hope to bring them out for public engagement next month. Um, and then the last step will be the development of our final plan. And that will would be expected to come forward for consideration of approval by those three boards uh, late this year. So with the first round of engagement, we did a lot of different ways of outreach, of doing outreach. Um, you know, it was during COVID times, so we had to adjust to the situation. Uh, we had a lot of online resources. We have a website on the Engage Durham website. Uh, we did an online survey. We did a lot of stakeholder meetings like this, you know, that's online through Zoom. And lastly, we did an engagement ambassadors program, which was done in the model of Durham's equitable engagement blueprint. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So the, the online survey, you know, we do a lot of online surveys and um, they're an easy way to reach a lot of people quickly. Uh, however, you know, we find that they aren't always demographically representative of Durham or de demographically representative of our transit riders. So our online survey responses are, are here. Um, it definitely skewed um, more white and higher income than Durham as a whole and our transit riders. Uh, but 50% were current transit riders. Uh, like I said, we did stakeholder meetings. Here's a, a sample of some of the organizations we met with in the first round. Uh, we expect to do this again. Um, if you have any suggestions for organizations to meet with, we, we welcome your suggestions. And then thirdly was the engagement ambassador program. So that was done, like I said, in the model of the city's equitable engagement blueprint. So we did direct enga engagement with underrepresented communities. So uh, communities of color, Spanish speakers, youth, lower income, um, rural residents. Uh, we compensated ambassadors to hold sessions like this or talk to their neighbors and get input from their peers and their community uh, groups and organizations. Um, we, we were hoping to get half of our comments from the ambassadors in the first round. We didn't quite meet that, uh, but we, we're going to do this again and we, we hope that we'll have uh, a wider uh, reach in the second round. So the engagement ambassador responses were more targeted at, at people of color and our um, demographic represent or statistics support that. There's lower income, more persons of color, 70% um, current transit riders. So across all three engagement efforts, there was a lot, there were a lot of common themes. And a lot of these really are well supported by those videos that you saw. So improved bus stops, increased sidewalk access, um, more access to jobs, uh, more 15 minute service. So you don't have to wait as long for the next bus and more crosstown routes. You know, the Go Durham system right now, uh, most routes go downtown and you have to transfer. So people want more options to go maybe east, west across North Durham or South Durham. Um, and there was also interest in commuter rail. So the, our original plan had the commuter rail project in there, which is uh, a rail connection between Durham and Wake County. Um, and it's still in our plan and it's, it's a project being considered in this plan update. There were some differences. Uh, the engagement ambassadors prioritized para paratransit service highest among all options. Um, and there was more of an emphasis on street maintenance and road quality, uh, wheelchair, stroller access, and service running later at night, which you know, helps provide access to jobs that maybe aren't traditional commuting hours. All right, so now I'm gonna pass it over to Aaron to talk about how we used that feedback in the second round of scenario development. Okay, thanks, 
Thanks, Ellen. Um, yeah, so what we've done is, oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> what we've done is we've put together three scenarios uh, that have different uh, levels of investment and different types of projects in them. And one thing I wanna make sure everybody understands is that as we do our uh, in next round of engagement around these scenarios, our goal is not to have people pick scenario A, scenario B, or scenario C. Uh, we understand that whatever whatever becomes our preferred scenario at the end of this process and is eventually adopted in the plan will probably be a mix of elements from each of the three scenarios. And what we're trying to do is find out from people what is the what are the most important aspects to them in each of these scenarios. Now there are some scenarios that there are some things that are addressed at the same level in each scenario. So they all provide more frequent service, uh, expanding 30 minute service so that we don't have uh, so many of our routes running um, at one hour and then expanding a few routes uh, from 30 minute service to 15 service. They all include, like I mentioned before, uh, an improvement of bus stops across the Go Triangle and Go Durham systems. And they all provide uh, service running later at night to either midnight or 12.30 in the morning, depending on the day. So we've got all of those as key as common elements throughout all three, all three scenarios. Where the scenario is different are where you see the blue dots. Um, some scenarios are able to afford more bus routes than others because they've got other things in them. Uh, some provide better access to say Orange County or Wake County and therefore the jobs in those areas. Uh, some are able to provide more sidewalks because there's simply more funding available for sidewalks, though we are looking at having all of our bus stop improvements at least include sidewalks to the nearest intersection. Um, and that would be ADA compliant as well. So the, the curb cut would be such that, that a wheelchair could get onto that sidewalk and then you could take the sidewalk to get to the bus stop. Uh, that would also be ADA compliant. Um, so there's a few things that are different throughout the, the scenarios, but um, some of them are, are the same. So go ahead and next slide, please. So we're just calling them generic terms at this time, A, B, and C, and they all have pros and cons. Uh, scenario A is where we're focusing primarily on bus operations. Uh, we're focusing on reducing headways to 15 minutes wherever we can. Like I said, extending hours, especially in the evening and on weekends. Um, and we're able to do this in scenario A because we're putting most of the funding in those operations. There are some capital expenditures for, you know, we've got to buy buses in order to run more, uh, run more buses. Uh, we have to increase, uh, improve our bus operations and maintenance facility. We'll have some more park and ride lots and transfer centers and so forth. But for the most part, we're really focusing on just ramping up both the Go Durham and the Go Triangle systems. Scenario A therefore also provides us the most amount of funding for sidewalk and access and for paratransit. Next slide, please. Scenario B is focusing more on uh, bus capital improvements. So, uh, you know, how are we uh, improving the street cross sections themselves to allow the buses to run uh, more often and more efficiently? So in places where we can, we'll put in dedicated lanes we can get the articu long articulated buses and specialized stops for those uh, on a say bus rapid transit ser service. Um, and this would provide us uh, improved regional connections to Chapel Hill, improved regional connections to RTP. And in RTP, you could connect to the Wake County bus rapid transit system and be able to access everything that, that transit provides you over in Wake County. Because we're doing all this, uh, these improvements to the road network to allow the buses to uh, run more efficiently, we don't have as much money to do sidewalk access and paratransit improvements. Um, and we just can't run as many bus operations improvements, you know, not run as many uh, routes on a 15 minute system, not run as late as previously. I think in this scenario, we might only be running till 11 o'clock on Sundays. So we've got some trade-offs there. We're, we've got certain routes that are gonna be able to have um, improved sidewalks, improved dedicated lanes, transit signal priorities, queue jumps, things like that in scenario B, but that means less money for operations than in scenario A. Next slide, please. And then finally, 
Thank you, Eric, two minutes. Then finally in scenario C, this is where we include commuter rail from West Durham to uh, Wake County and potentially to Johnston County. Um, this, does, this would have five stops in uh, Durham. This would be at West Durham, uh, sort of near the Duke campus, but more along the line, more near Hillsborough Road over there by that food lion, downtown Durham, uh, the Alston Avenue area of East Durham, uh, Ellis Road out in the Bethesda area, and then down in RTP. Uh, again, we'd have fewer sidewalk access improvements and paratransit improvements. Um, the main thing is that the operate the bus operational improvements need to happen later. There's a good amount of money that goes into uh, constructing and operating the commuter rail system. So therefore, uh, the bus operation improvements get pushed back five to 10 years in order to be able to finance everything. We do get some improvements um, earlier, but some of those improvements need to wait until later. Um, and then next steps. So what we're planning for with our phase two outreach, which is the, our outreach to get input from the public on our three scenarios. Tentative release date is May 17th. We're gonna do this as Ellen talked about earlier in our phase one, we're gonna do the same methods here. We're gonna run our engaged and ambassadors program and that's gonna be ramped up from the start. So we, uh, we expect that to be a very robust uh, engagement process this time. Uh, we'll, we'll run our same stakeholder interviews as we did last time. And if you have additional um, groups that you'd like us to read out, reach out to, we'd be happy to do so. We will uh, conduct an online survey as we did before. And we'll also do some in-person tabling events. Uh, last time we did them at uh, the Village, Durham Station and the Regional Transportation Center. And so we'll look to do those again. Uh, the, we look to conclude that outreach in mid to late June. Um, once we got heard the input on all three of those priorities, uh, all of our priorities from our, across our scenarios, we'll put those together for inclusion in a final plan. We hope to have that preferred scenario ready by the latter half of August. Next slide. And there we go. So yeah, mid-May to late June for phase two outreach. We'll construct a preferred scenario in July and we'll update the elected boards in August and begin our phase three outreach around late August or early September. And I believe with that, we are concluded. I'd be happy to open it to questions. Yeah, thank you to both Ellen and Aaron for mm -hmm. that presentation. Um, I do want to start with, we do have about uh, seven or eight minutes for questions. I want, I want to start with a couple that there are in the chat, um, just because uh, people kind of got those in early. A few of the earlier ones were um, addressed already, uh, either in the chat or uh, in the previous conversation. But I will start with, um, with Marie's question. I think it's a, it's a really good one. Um, and the... Um, the question about just how how engagement um, you know makes changes to the the, the plans you know the, the, the original plans or from where we are today to the final scenario um, you know how how does that work exactly how is that going to be shown in the in the ultimate up plan update so our, our I mean our goal all along has been to have our public input drive the priorities for what is in this plan. Um, now we have, you know, lots of different folks with lots of different opinions. Uh, we're looking to hear from everybody and we're taking steps to make sure that we can especially hear from uh, current transit riders and from those who maybe haven't been heard as much as they should have been in the past. Um, but we are taking all of that input uh, seriously and we're making it the driving force for play. Okay. Um, uh, maybe I didn't it, answer the question, but no, it's it. I um, yeah, I, I I could follow on later, but I don't want to sure. take time out of this meeting because okay. um, I think there are questions about you know you know how exactly who's who's input. I guess uh, how, if there's weighted any differently or if everything's sort of weighted together. I, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask that now. I guess because I think that's sure. Important. I mean, we're not doing we're not doing necessarily a waiting, right? We're not saying this this feedback is um, weighted higher than that feedback, but we are making sure to uh, 
get as much input from, like I said, current transit riders and uh, those communities which depend more on transit than others. They're, they're, they're the ones that we're making sure we hear from and we respond to. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me get to Jim's question um, because he's asking about the, uh, how any differences that come up between the Durham and Wake plans, although I would, mm -hmm. I would say orange as well since um, right. some of these scenarios include either you know, bus mm -hmm. rapid transit or elements of bus rapid transit into Orange County. Um, how would those differences, how will those differences be uh, reconciled? And he gives the example of uh, the amount of funds, I assume he means local sort of county funds um, mm -hmm. for commuter rail. But again, same question could exist for bus rapid transit. Sure, and we're gonna have to have those conversations. Um, and that's why the plan needs to be a, a rather um, organic and living document, right? We don't know if, you know, there are talks going going right now, my understanding, at least the beginnings of talks between Durham County and Orange County. Yeah, I can. I'm sorry, talk. Durham County and, and, and Wake County. Go ahead, Ellen, do you want to? Yeah, I can that? speak to that. So yeah. um, uh, currently, the way that we, you know, talk about cost share for projects and schedules has been occurring uh, with the county commissioners to the to the Durham and Orange County commissioners. So like Aaron's saying, we've already initiated some conversations with Wake County and um, Orange County on this. Um, you are correct. There are some differences um, between Durham and, and Wake County on the cost share for the commuter rail project. Um, there's a lot that has to be worked out um, on that. Um, it's something that we will be working on over the next six months or so before we finalize the plan. Um, uh, it remains to be seen, you know, I guess how it's going to turn out. Uh, but there's, you know, there's, there's both the cost share and there's the schedule between the two counties. Um, we have different resources uh, available through our transit taxes. Um, and we do need to coordinate with them on that. I guess I don't have an answer right now, but it's something that is certainly very important and is, is being worked on right now. All right, thanks. Um, I, we only have time for a couple, a couple more questions. Um, I'm seeing a specific one from L Larissa about, <clears throat> you know, a, a, about a specific route, uh, Route 4. I, I'm gonna just hold off on that, I think, until the scenarios come out, because I know that just in seeing some of the early materials that it's that may be addressed in some scenarios and not in others. So I think that's that's the type of thing that when those scenarios come out will be very important to look at those specific mm -hmm. type of improvements. Um, I do want to get to a question, uh, another one from Marie about um, fare free service. I know that is that has gotten um, has been discussed quite a bit over the last several mm -hmm. years. Uh, there was the Bull City Connector at one point, which 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 was eventually discontinued. Um, but are there any discussions about um, whether that, you know, it, just that that topic, whether fare free service is being considered as part of the plan update? So the way we originally structured the contract with our consultants was to do a study of fare free service. Um, and look at what the costs would be to actually get that up and running. Not necessarily recommend fare free in this, but, but give a solid answer as to what it would take to put the fare free service in. And then we could do a later amendment of the plan if that's how uh, the transit partners decided to, to use the funding in order to do that. Um, but COVID has thrown us into a bit of a loop on that. You know, we've been running fare free for a while. Um, I think there was more apprehension towards fare free uh, prior to COVID, but now that we've been doing it and I need to have a conversation with the folks at GoDurham as to uh, whether that's going to be continuing into the next fiscal year. Um, all that to say is it's still a bit up in the air because of how Go Durham and Go Triangle have had to respond to COVID. And I think that's still something to be discussed. OK, 
Okay, thank you. I know we need to um, get back to the rest of the agenda. I do want to just acknowledge uh, some of the other comments that are coming in on the chat. They're not necessarily questions, but yeah. uh, seeing some uh, concerns about the length of time that it will take to build commuter rail, um, mm -hmm. right? That, you know, eight years, 10 years is, right. is a, long, a long ways. And there are, as you've heard in the videos and in other ways, there are lots of mm -hmm immediate needs. So that is um, something I want to at least just acknowledge. Right. Um, trying to see what else, you know, concerns about um, providing a service to, to Duke um, uh, based on, you know, some of their role in the light rail project. Um, yeah. So again, just, you know, and making sure there's a lot of comments about making sure that underrepresented communities are, are really being listen to um, mm -hmm. uh, again in, in in our take as the transit equity campaign that they're made the first priority uh, in this plan update so again didn't want to take too much more time with that but um, I want to at least acknowledge those comments because there were several in the chat yes um, yeah so with that uh, I know we need to move on I'm going to pass this back to uh, Marie to finish up the agenda and thank you again to Aaron and, and Ellen for, for coming and providing those presentations. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Anytime. Uh, thank you because uh, we were able to, uh, uh, to get some more engagement and we appreciate that and uh, appreciate you responding to some of those questions. Uh, that really helps a lot because the, the opportunity that we have is very limited and uh, We'd like to see uh, the community to uh, have a chance to voice what their needs are. And so we appreciate that information. Uh, we have uh, next updates for uh, longtime home owner tax assistance. And that's Jim Svara. Are you there, Jim? I'm here, I'll give you a quick report. The only thing that, that is definitely available at this point uh, is the Durham City Longtime Homeowners Grant Program. They have finally opened up applications. Uh, this would be for the extra tax, the higher amount you paid in property tax in 2019 compared to 2015. Uh, and uh, whereas earlier, some people looked at the program and it didn't make a big enough uh, difference to be worth applying, you need to look at it again because with the property reappraisal that occurred in 2019, uh, the increase has, has, has expanded. Uh, also, we are trying to um, uh, work with the legislative delegation uh, to clarify the authority of Durham County and city uh, to provide tax assistance grants. Uh, there is a, a local bill that has been submitted um, uh, that would uh, make it clear that an allowable purpose for housing assistance uh, is helping people remain in their homes. Uh, in addition, um, Senator Murdoch has, has introduced a bill that would expand eligibility uh, for the circuit breaker pro the state circuit breaker program, uh, similar to the local <clears throat> uh, deferred payment approach, except that only the last three years of deferred payments have to be repaid under that under that program. Uh, so we'll see how that goes, and and that's that the proposal has come from uh, from a legislator in Wake County as well. Uh, so we'll, we're monitoring that, and we'll share with the group what as things move forward. Thank you very much. That sounds like good information to me. Uh, the next person is Marsha McNally, and she has the updates for Northgate Redevelopment. Marsha. Uh, thanks, Marie. Several times I've talked about uh, what's been going on at the neighborhood level in terms of Northgate Mall um, redevelopment. Rib Gully and I have been working mm, for maybe nine months with um, community people in Walltown and then the newly formed Northgate Mall, Mall Neighborhood Council, which includes six additional neighborhoods, first to develop um, design alternatives, sort of site planning design alternatives um, for uh, Northgate Mall site based on the goals um, of, the, of the neighborhoods. They have uh, done a goal setting process. We had, we developed three um, th through a charrette process, three 
alternatives. Um, and these, uh, these were tested out, so to speak, in the survey that they ran over the winter, um, along with other questions to, to community people like, what kind of shopping are you looking for? What kind of grocery store would you like? Is affordable housing a priority uh, for this area, this site? Um, how would you like um, the neighborhood and Walter and Northgate to better connect with each other, particularly through open space, parks, trails, and so on? Anyway, this Saturday at 10 o'clock uh, in the morning at Walltown Park, there will be um, a presentation of the results of this um, big survey. And uh, um, we've been asked to share that information and hope invite people to, to come. Masks are required, um, but uh, it will be outside. And um, I think you'll find the, um, the results um, super, inform super um, informative and super useful. They've been very purposeful. Um, and very systematic, um, particularly with the help from uh, DataWorks and um, uh, from the uh, NC State School of Design, Department of Landscape, Architecture and Planning, um, I think have been producing um, good information. So it's sort of, it's interesting to talk about this in comparison to what Aaron and Ellen just presented. Um, um, so I encourage you all to come again, Walton Park, 10 o'clock this Saturday. Um, for um, an update on the survey results. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Marsha. I appreciate that. And uh, the, we're going to adjourn the future events and meetings. We meet every third Monday, and uh, that will be the next meeting, I guess. So anybody else have any comments? We'll just adjourn. Marie, Marie let me add a quick word if I can. Sure. Um, and actually a week from tomorrow, the coalition has a policy committee that will ha have a meeting at uh, five o'clock in the afternoon. And it's it's on the agenda and, and the link information is there or you can get it from uh, Becky Winders. But uh, everyone's invited to that uh, where we talk about the different policy initiatives going on. And then um, uh, early in May, May 3rd at noon, there's the coordinating committee which tries to set up these meetings and, and do other kinds of work for the coalition. And everyone's invited to that. You're encouraged to come. And then uh, next month's meeting on May 17th, we're gonna be hearing from uh, the Durham Housing Authority, uh, Anthony Scott, it's CEO. And it's an event that's jointly sponsored with Representative Zach Hawkins and the, the DHA town hall meetings that he and uh, others have worked to set up. So that'll be uh, on May 17th, the Monday at noon. And everybody is welcome and would love to have you come to that. Thank you. Thank you, Wib. That, that was the missing piece. <laughs> so we appreciate that. And is there anybody else that have any other comments? We're just going to adjourn the meeting and see everybody at one of those wonderful other meetings. Okay. Maria? Yes. You've done a beautiful job. Thank you so much. You're awesome. welcome. I enjoyed it. Awesome. Well done. All right. Y'all have a good rest of the day.